On this episode of Warbird Radio Presents, we sit down with the P-47 pilot who discovered the Nazis' location before the Battle of the Bulge. Stay tuned. Warbird Radio Presents the Eugene Smith Story starts now. When I first met Eugene Smith, I wouldn't have pegged him as a ukulele player. But as it turns out, he is. He's also an accomplished saxophone, clarinet, and guitar virtuoso. But you can't take any of those with you to war. But as Eugene told me, you can pack a ukulele. Here now is Eugene Smith. A long time ago, there was a program called the Civil, a- Civil, a- Civil Aviation or something like that. And it was sponsored by the military. And I was in college. And if you qualified physically and everything, you could get this program at a reduced price. And as I remember, it cost me $6 an hour for airplane and instructor. And what were you flying? It, it just this Piper time, Cubs yeah, and that type yeah. aircraft. Mm-hmm. And I flew enough to solo and rent planes and everything, but I didn't have a license at that time. But I did rent the planes for fun and go, you know, do things, take little trips for fun. <laughs> And then when I realized that at my age, I was in college at the time, I realized that one way or the other, I was going to have to go to the service. And I was living in Kilgore. So you're, you're, a, you're a native Texan then? Yeah, I was born in Beaumont. <laughs> okay. And I hitchhiked a ride to Dallas. I was going to join the Naval Air Corps. Well, I passed all the tests with flying colors, all the dexterity tests and mental tests and everything got to the physical and they flunked me out they said I should be careful about riding elevators because I had a problem with my heart hmm. well, that upset me a little bit and I went back to college I was still you know I didn't drop out of college to do that I just went up there and then I was thinking you know during that period in college I was out an awful lot. I was playing in a dance orchestra and staying out late at night and making classes. And then some afternoons, I'd be going over from the college to the high school to teach music. And so I figured maybe I was a little bit short of sleep. So I tried again. At, I don't remember where I went then. Was it back to Dallas somewhere? But I went to the Army Air Force then, Army Air Corps. And I passed all their tests without any problem. They never said anything about the heart. And came back, got out of the service, went to Venezuela for an oil company. They didn't say anything about my heart. Came back and got in the reserve while well, I became an instructor first, a civilian flight instructor for the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And they didn't say anything about my heart. And I got in the Air Force Reserve active duty here, I mean active unit here, flying C-119s, and they didn't say anything about my heart. They never said anything about my heart, even after I retired. <laughs> they never brought it up again. <laughs> you were telling us you were born in 1923, so yeah. I'd say your heart's pretty good still. Well, that's, I guess it's fairly good. I'm, <laughs> it's still working, isn't it? <laughs> the only thing I take for it is an occasional martini. And a <laughs> <laughs> Self-medicate, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you went on to have a, a quite the career then, even after the war, but let's 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 talk about uh, some of your, your World War II experience. You were a, a P-47 driver. I graduated from advanced in a, a class of 44B mm-hmm. in El Paso, I mean in Eagle Pass, Texas. And in this advanced course, I got to fly a little bit of T-30, uh, P-39 and a P-40, mm-hmm. just very briefly, just checked out in them. And then after that, I was... Went to, I believe, North Carolina, and I checked out in P-47s. Now, what did you think about flying the P-47 here versus flying it uh, overseas? I mean, obviously, there were some differences. The fuel was different. The uh, the, the props well, I mean, were a little different. It wasn't a, all that much difference. Of course, I got a later model overseas. Mm-hmm. But I developed a, a pretty secure feeling with the P-47. 
And I, di I didn't have any feeling one way or the other for it when I joined, when I started flying it here in the States. And then we had the, the gunnery training and all various other things. And I remember our safety people saying, if you have trouble or get shot at, got shot up or something, just remember to land it straight ahead. Don't stall it out somewhere. Just be, fly it through buildings or whatever you have to do. Just <laughs> It'll get you there. Get your level mm -hmm. as near as it can on landing. So I always kept that in mind. And then after we finished the gunnery practice and all that in the P-47, I was expecting a ship ride overseas, but seven of us were selected for some reason or other to fly. Mm -hmm. And we were sent to New York and this, we were supposed to join some type of special unit overseas. As far as I know, we never found the unit, or they never found us. <laughs> we, we got to Presswick, Scotland, and nobody seemed to know what to do with us, and they sent us to a, a base in England, and I, they didn't, the war was going on strong, but we weren't in combat at that point. Mm -hmm. And I remember just they tell me to take a plane and says go out and fly and it and then just go out and fly and I just I just tested the plane to see how high it would go and I flew through clouds and all this just taking time, just killing time flying. And this was a P forty seven. This is all on the P forty seven. And then finally I was sent to France just after D Day. I don't know how long after, maybe two weeks, a month, or something like that. Anyway, I was on the first strip that was established on the, off the beach in France. So you're, you're there in June sometime, I guess. I right? guess it was June. I don't remember right. exactly. And we had a wire mesh. Our landing strip was a wire mesh strip. So I had to wake you up when you were going down the runway, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you could only, if it was raining at all, you could only land one direction and take off the other because you couldn't taxi alongside it. It was too muddy and too messy. A lot of accidents out there? Well, no, you, they weren't, really weren't. Mm -hmm. The main accident was fear of getting, I think, getting shot by the Navy. When you, we came <laughs> in to land, we were, we were being shot at on two sides, basically, mm -hmm. with the, the Germans on one side mm -hmm. and the, our Navy on the other, because we weren't supposed, at this point, we were not supposed to be flying after dark. You you really were. I mean, you were on the the bleeding edge of this. You really were on the front <laughs> until right? the end of the yeah. European mm -hmm. thing. And as a, I remember the pilot who took us in for check rides. Had check ride before we went into combat. And one of the things he'd like that he was a West Point graduate and later became a very high up, but he was a character. But he take us on a follow the leader thing. And he says, you've got to keep up. Well, you're my wingman, and we're in trouble, and you've got to keep up with whatever I do. Well, I, I took him for his word. <laughs> and anything he did, I, could, I stayed with him. I, he never lost me in anything. But <laughs> at least one of the guys that was in that original seven absolutely could not keep up with him. And he'd get lost. He'd get lost from him. And he was trans he was transferred out. He later flew uh, DC three, something a little uh, C forty seven. Uh, you don't need to follow anybody with that, I guess. <laughs> no, you just, you just fly the dignitaries around right. with that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I I trusted this man quite a bit. He was a hot rodder, but he says if you'll stick with me, he says we'll get the target and we'll get back. And again, I believed him. And one re reason he couldn't lose me. And I figured we're flying the same kind of airplane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if his will do that, mine will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever he can do, you can do. Right? That's what yeah. I thought, you know, the airplane. As far as the air, mm -hmm. we were flying the same airplane. But he, I'll never forget the first combat mission for me. It was a, a fly, I think we had a flight of, I don't know, well, most of the time we went out and flight of four, but we might have had a 12 Formation, 12 ship formation, and I remembered as we approached this combat zone, I could just see a solid layer of black puffs and mm -hmm. where the anti-aircraft was going. 
And he, he had already said, you might not see the target the first time or two we fly, but you go down and shoot where I do or drop your bombs where I do. Well, when we saw all that flack, I wasn't sure we'd ever get there. But we did, and we did find the target and go down. And from then on, I, I learned, I looked for the target. I could find the targets, too. Now, what, what kind of targets were you going after? We were going after mostly, at that time, trucks and tanks. Right. And then later, of course, trains and... Later, we went yeah. after a lot of, we got a lot of train locomotives. Yeah. But that, at that point, it, we were in, at, after tanks and uh, mm -hmm. heavy, heavy vehicles. Now, were you, were you a part of the 57th or the 56th Fighter Group, any of those units? Uh, the group was the 368th Fighter Group, 9th Air Force, mm -hmm. and my flight was a, a 395th Fighter Squadron. So your airplane, I guess, uh, did you fly the same one for the most part? A lot of guys, of course, well, we named up, their airplanes. We, we and went up and modeled it. It seems like to me the P-47N was, a, was the one that was assigned one of the last, later models that I flew. Okay. And they had, the one in the States didn't have a bubble canopy, but the, those, the later ones, at least over there, had a bubble canopy. Mm -hmm. Better visibility. And now what, what did you name your airplane? Lady be good. Well, of course, right? <laughs> From a musician's point From of view. From a musician's down the point, I had a <laughs> nice lady painted on it, too. I can just imagine what, it, what you must have been like over there. Did you take a saxophone with you? No, I didn't. Did you find one when you got there, though? No, I didn't. But I, <laughs> I, Yeah, I did. I, I did. I did borrow one. But what I did was bought a ukulele in New York, <laughs> which I still have. <laughs> Do you really? You had to be you had to be pretty dangerous over there, not only with the airplane but also with the ladies. I guess uh, here's this no. musician and fighter pilot walking around. That that had to be a lot of fun over there it, when when you're on your downtime. I'm sure you guys. I, well, I, I used to be pretty shy about the ladies. I guess yeah. I flew a lot of missions. I, I flew a lot because of this flight leader I always liked me to fly, to be up with him, mm -hmm. fly his wing or something because he knew I'd be there. And also, I had a, a great knack for learning how to find out where I was or, learn, or knowing where I was. And he had that reputation of always knowing where he was, too. So I, I followed his lead pretty well. <laughs> there, weren't a, there weren't no GPSs back then. I mean, no, was, no, there weren't. This was, was, was really, uh, you had to be on your toes. And, of course, yeah. you're in the middle of a combat situation. So it's it, easier said than done. Well, I was building a lot of time. I was flying a lot of missions. And... Our first encounter with fighters got me shot down, but I made it back to the our bay. I, I tried to bail out. What they did was they went through part of the canopy and shot actually shot a flap off, and the flap stood up mm. vertically on the wing. The airplane won't fly straight and level. And it then. doesn't fly very well. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I spun out then. Mm -hmm. I, that went, I went down. And so I was trying to bail out because I thought, well, it's going all the way down. That I couldn't bail out because the canopy had been damaged by the 20-millimeter mm -hmm. slug that went through part of it. So I sat down and got both feet on the, on the rudder and my, both hands on the control and recovered it. Tested it a little bit to see how much control I had when, when it was my control was only at full power and full just going with both hands and both feet that was the way I could mm. sort of control it and I got it back to our field and <laughs> everybody gathered around to watch the crash <laughs> and I thought I was going to make it down but I, I had too much speed and I couldn't as I slowed it down I lose control of it mm. So I said, well, I'll just go down to the end of the runway and ground loop it, because I mm -hmm. knew that big old plane would ground loop pretty well. But as I got down to the end of the runway, all these people gathered around to see the crash. And I was afraid if I ground looped, I'd ground loop <laughs> into well, some into of everybody else. So I just put on the brakes the best I could and tried to hold it back, and it flipped over. Mm. And after that... Uh, I was already picking up a lot of time, and we were about to move our location. So they put me in, and there were two officers and I think eight enlisted personnel, went on this move to set up the next base. And from that point on, every move that our unit made, I was on the, the advanced echelon to, to go establish the next base. 
We had so you to, were continuing to move up as the front yeah, was progressing. Yeah, we move up so we'd always be close and not have to use so much time and fuel going to the battle. Well, I, I, I want to go back to something that you, you said. You said your first encounter with fighters. What? What were you encountering? Were they were they one oh nines or one nineties? No, 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 those were F, those were F one ninety, the long nose one ninety, and they attacked us. And I didn't actually I didn't see them till I I was uh, already hit. Mm -hmm. But I'll guarantee you, they never got close to me again without me seeing them. <laughs> well, and anyway, I, this the mission of going and establishing the new bases proved to be. A, a pretty interesting one in itself, and we went to a lot of them. Well, we moved a lot of times because we were keeping the distance as close as we could to the front line. We were working directly with the ground forces with Patton for a lot of it, and we even had uh, uh, people with Patton in the tanks to tell us where to. They they put out. Panel, what they call it, cerise panel. They were brightly mm -hmm. colored panels. That don't don't bomb any behind that or anything, or don't shoot behind that. Just stay in front of it. And they were using pilots to do that. Mm -hmm. And I was on the list to go there, but I was doing so many other things that I did, never did go with the tank. I just flew all the time. Mm -hmm. well, talk about one of your most memorable missions. One, the one that that stands out in your in your mind still. I guess one of them, uh, the biggest one, we were flying a long mission. We were supposed to drop the bombs in, in a location, and then we were going on to another base to land to refill, so we could refuel. That was a pretty far out mission. And there were 12 of us in the group. And on the way, uh, we had reports of enemy fighters in here, mm -hmm. and on the way, there were we found them a lot of them. There were some fifty of them, and they were above us, circling to get into position. These are one nineties again, I guess. They were those were one ninety then. Mm -hmm. uh, there might have been some uh, Messerschmitts in there too. Well, this is a fast airplane that you're up Both against. Of them, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Very fast airplane. But anyway, as we were climbing, we jettisoned our bombs and we began climbing to meet them. But as we were climbing, I happened to spot. Another group attacking us, attacked in my flight right then. Hmm. And I, I yelled, flapper yellow, break left. And that's that, when you break, that means you don't ask any questions. You turn hard, whichever way I, somebody says. So we turned, and sure enough, I, from that moment on, we were in battle. So there's 12 of you and 50 of them at that point. At that point, right. yeah, 50 or more. But mm -hmm. well, 50, we were climbing up to meet the 50. But the, the these guys that, came out of nowhere. <laughs> the others can't slipped up on them. And I was looking around, and I, could, I was seeing planes going down all over the place. And I said, boy, they've, they've shot us all down. Mm -hmm. Oh, and my wingman was a, an instructor pilot from the States who was new into the combat. And he was getting training. He was, he was leading my element of, of two planes. And when, when they, we said break left, he says, you, Smitty, you take over. I'll follow you. That's the last I saw of him. He, mm. he he managed to get out of that and go home, but I don't know how he got out, but he did. He, he didn't have any fighting encounters or anything. He just got out and got home. But I I was there. And I had a bomb hung up under one wing, so I just, everything was defensive from then on as far as I was mm. concerned. I wasn't really out to try to make any kill, but I got two confirmed victories, mm. confirmed by both the guns, gun camera and other people seeing them. With a bomb on your wing. Yeah, with a bomb. <laughs> and then afterwards, I'm, al I'm, I'm alone in the area, and I see a, a crippled P-47 down low trying to find his way back and get his way back home. So I decided, well, I better go down and at least stick with them, follow him. Hmm. And I remember on this trip back, a German plane was coming from the other direction and we were not moving at high, such high speeds then that we couldn't see each other and I saw this guy looking over at me and I'm looking at him and I've got a, a crippled plane with me too we, we just kept going <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to he didn't want to tangle and neither did he you at that point he didn't want to tangle mm -hmm. anyway we 
we got back and we out of that encounter, we had 17 confirmed victories and we lost one plane. Mm. 17 confirmed and one, and one loss. And, and those are confirmed, not... Yeah, those are confirmed victories right. and one loss. Who knows what the real tally was? Well, there were, there were some more. I got a probable and a, a couple <laughs> of things like that, but the ones that I had on the gun camera were, you know... They were actually they were they were solid to see. So that was I guess that was probably one of the one of the most intensive things we did. Mm-hmm. We did a lot of things. We bombed bridges. And another item that we one mission we for some reason we couldn't execute the mission because of weather, and we were going back and still had bombs, and we spotted a bridge and and we took out that bridge. And then we get a letter of commendation that's saying the B-25s have been trying to take out that bridge for 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> just just well, sitting in the P-47 guys. And we got it in the P-47. Well, you guys had such a, a diverse mission. I mean, really and truly, you were, you were ground targets. Mostly, mostly we were ground targets with either tanks or, or uh, locomotives. But then you could take out airplanes in the air as well, which was pretty good. Oh, rare. yeah. Well, this, this was built as a high-altitude yeah. fighter. It had eight fifty caliber machine guns. Mm-hmm. That's pretty potent firepower. When you when you when you pull the trigger, you felt it. Yeah, yeah, it'll it would slow you down. And then later in the war, we also got rockets. But mm-hmm. most of the time, uh, that th- the things that we did mostly were with the machine guns. But we did use some rockets on some locomotives and some tank areas too. You know, one thing about the P forty seven that that sticks in my mind is it it had a Pretty decent range. How, how long were most of these missions? Well, most of the missions that I flew were about three, three and a half hours. Some of them, well, a lot of them less than that at, in the first part of the war when we didn't have to go so far. Mm-hmm. And we used to rotate on, on when you were up for a mission. If you if you were on it for a week, you rotated out and somebody else moved in place. Hmm. And we had a couple. Of, we had one long range mission that we knew was really bad. And I rotated out of one time, that one time, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I thought, well, I don't have to go on that, and rotated back into it again. <laughs> so. so you followed, you, you, you were literally there as, as we made our, our conquest across Europe to drive them back, I guess. That, that was, you yeah. were right there on the, on, on, on the front. The on everything, time. yeah, all, yeah, always on the front, yeah. Well, thank you for your service. Well, thank, That's thank a, you. not an easy job to do. It's something I guess perhaps I pleased that I did, but it's not not something I'd look forward to doing again. We need to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll have more from Mr. Smith. This is Word Radio. Welcome back. On this episode of Warbird Radio Presents, we're talking to P-47 pilot Eugene Smith. Here now is the conclusion of our conversation with Mr. Smith. Oh, another mission that was worth a little note was... It, it's the one that got me another medal and a presidential acknowledgement from the higher-up headquarters. Of oh, it. that little thing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but as the Germans began their plunge through Belgium, they did it when the weather was terrible and we couldn't get, nobody knew where they were. Our forces didn't know where they were and our, our planes couldn't fly to look for them because of the bad weather. And at that point, we had a a commander, a CO that I respected and liked. And I remember his name was Sparks, Major Sparks. And he said, on one of our little missions, he said, we've got a, a little problem. He said, we've got a lot of Germans and we don't know where they are. He says, is there somebody in here that would fly a mission with me? to go look for them. And he sort of looked at me because I had this re- reputation then of knowing where I was and keeping mm-hmm. up with where I was. So 
I said, I'll do it. And he said, well, good. <laughs> so we flew, the two of us flew, and the weather was so bad that you had to stay, oh, I mean, very close to each other in order to keep sight. This is in the dead of winter, I'm guessing. And I don't, it, it was a... Nasty weather. It was, it was, it was bad, it was mm-hmm. pretty bad weather. But we stayed low, and we found, we found the column. Hmm. And we took a couple of strafing runs at them to try to do a little bit of damage. But the main thing we wanted to do was get back with the location. And how many did you see down there, was it? Just lines, just far lines as you could see, lines. just about, yeah. And these are tanks that are down there? There were and tanks and, and truck, trucks and uh, troops moving beside the vehicles. And, it was mm. there was a lot of people moving, and that's and, intelligence that, that that your base and everybody behind you really needed. So we got to get back and let's, we report this in, and that's when that's when all the the big battle of the bulge began. And you were the guy that found it. Well, that, that's what they said. That we were the first one to find it. We were at least we were the first one to find that area. That's what they knew, and so. That had to be pretty special. Uh, it, I, it, well, I realized it later, but at that time, it's just a, it's another scary mission. Yeah, I, and you're glad you're not down there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I flew a number of missions during the Battle of the Bulge, and I remember on those seeing an awful lot of airplanes going down, and a lot of those were ours. Mm-hmm. The medium-sized bombers and fighters, too. So we lost a lot of aircraft. I remember we lost one of our guys, the P-47 guy, but we were re- reunited with him later. He went down, and he, I, I think he bailed out, but he he was down, and he was hiding in some grass at, at night trying to hide, and he woke up in the morning, and there were two Germans standing over him with a rifle, <laughs> and they were arguing with each other. I mean, so he held up his hand, and, and they kept arguing. And then in a minute, one of them just handed him the rifle and pointed back to himself. They wanted to be his prisoner. So he ended up with two prisoners, and then they they found a, a house to, they could stay in that night somehow or another. And the next morning, they were up shaving in the same, using the same helmet and everything. And before the day was over, he had about 15 prisoners that, volunteered to be prisoners and these two guys talked to him you know and he tried he was trying to give them away and he'd meet our troops on the way and they wouldn't take him because they didn't have room to have them until he had these about 15 prisoners for three or four days <laughs> what did you think when he showed back up with he rounded them up. Yeah, yeah, he just rounded them up. And he said that once they became prisoners, he wasn't afraid of them anymore because they didn't want they didn't want any more of that. that yeah. They knew they were on the losing end by this time. Mm-hmm. When it was all said and done, how, how many missions did you fly in the P-47? I had 87 combat missions in the P-47. And one of my most memorable meeting uh, missions was coming home. I had flown over, so I was hoping I'd get a ship ride back. That was what I had in mind. And Oh, I was in... Oh, I, I, speaking of prisoners, I'm sorry. I got to go further. In Munich, I was... Oh, for, let me tell you two, one other thing, too. Before the war, at Brown, around New Year's, or Christmas or New Year's, I was on this advanced echelon moving... Move, we went to one base, one place we were going to make a base, and we ended up digging trenches and everything there for the latrines. Mm-hmm. And before we ever, this was in the snow and ice, but before we got brought in planes, I got a notice to go ahead and move on to Metz, France, and establish a base mm-hmm. there. When we got to Metz, unfortunately, they hadn't taken it yet. <laughs> So we had to sit outside a couple of days till the battle was over, and, and I moved into a ski factory there. That's where I decided to make our base, at, right on, near there, the base itself. And they, there were bodies still in the foxholes, and mm-hmm. lots of bad. And the Germans 
another group moved in there too, and they brought their airplanes in first. And the Germans attacked us. And just about wiped out the other the squadron, the group that came in that moved airplanes in, and we didn't have any airplanes there, so we didn't lose any airplanes. Lost a little confidence, I think, but they weren't they weren't willing to let it go that easily. Is yeah. what it sounds like. Yeah. It, it, yeah. They did a lot of damage to us that, mm -hmm. when they they attacked. They hit pretty hard. <clears throat> But anyway, it was from Metz then that I went, that we moved to, I believe, Munich. And in Munich, was, as we were setting up the base, again, there's two officers and about eight enlisted personnel. The Germans started coming in and surrendering. Mm. And we had over a hundred of them. <laughs> and we had 12 of us trying to keep supplies going, trying to feed them. And we couldn't get anybody to take them either. <laughs> you rounded up more than you could handle at that point. Oh, huh? Yeah, we didn't even round them up. They yeah. just came in. Yeah. And so by the time we actually, and we never did, yeah, we did fly out of there. We flew, but the, by the time we flew out of there, mm -hmm. the actual war was over. Yeah. But we flew out, we continued to fly a few training missions and so forth, but the war itself was over. But it, it took a long time to get the, our prisoners taken care of. Yeah, and and you said you flew home. Now you were, yeah. What, well, what did that, you fly home in? Oh. A B twenty four, the old Liberator. Huh? I'm one of very few who survived a spin in a B twenty four. What 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 got you into that situation? <laughs> this was a, an old beat up warplane that was going back home for to be reworked or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I picked, we picked it up in Valley, Wales. I think there were 10 of us who rode back in it. All of us pilots. So we could log time as we came back. Well, it was in bad condition when we left Wales. And it was really bad condition by the time we got to Iceland. So we had to stay in Iceland about a week while they worked on that plane. None of us really wanted to go on it anymore. We already <laughs> said you had your fill. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we headed out of Iceland, and about halfway, about about our midpoint, we were in an icing conditions, and I could, I was in the back. I was in the back. Mostly it was cold, and I was zipped mm -hmm. up in a sleeping bag, and that tail. I could feel that tail wobbling more and more rough and the next thing I know we were all those of us in the back were all up and down in the plane there's a lot to bump into back there too I, I, I understand we were at 14,000 feet at that time hmm. and we recovered around 1400 feet the pilot recovered about 1400 feet and we were trying to get our parachutes on and everything and I'm thinking what good is it going to do to get a parachute on we're over the North Atlantic and our for a five-minute survival period if you landed. So I was thinking all that, but I still was trying to put the parachute on. <laughs> and also, I was angry. I was thinking, out here, I've gone through a whole combat, survived a combat tour, and I want to get killed going home. And I didn't want to fly home in the first place. <laughs> Those were my thoughts. But anyway, the plane did recover, and it came out with a jerk, and when it did, it, it snapped the gear down, broke hydraulic lines, and then we couldn't get the gear back up. They tried cranking it and everything, trying to get the gear back up, and we couldn't, afraid if we took it, got it, kept going, we were gonna lose any hydraulic fluid there might be. So the balance of the trip then was flown at slower speed with the gear halfway down. And that airplane doesn't like to fly slow, does it? It gets kind of mushy there. It, was, it, it, was, oh, it felt mushy to me from the time it stalled. I, I don't, it felt very much. So we get into Labrador, went into Labrador. Yeah. And we, as we were coming in, we had tried some more on the gear to try to get it down. And we, got, we managed to get the gear down, cranking. Mm -hmm. And then we rigged two parachutes in the back because we didn't think we'd have any brakes at all. Mm -hmm. So we rigged two parachutes to drop as we 
hit the ground, which we did. And they got it slowed down while it was still on the runway, and everybody got out and kissed the ground. And we're saying, well, we don't have to ride this old wreck anymore. Sure enough, we had to wait for it to be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> and they made you fly it on into the States. Went on into Massachusetts with wow. it then. Now, what did, what did you do after the war? You, you stayed in, you were in the, At this time, the Air Reserve. Uh, right? uh, they dropped the atomic bomb. I was scheduled to go back to the Pacific. But at this time, they dropped the atomic bomb, and those of us in the fighter, in these particular fighters at least, had the option at that point to opt out at that time and take an early out, early retirement, or to stay in and take various assignments, including the Pacific. Mine was going to be a weather reconnaissance. So I thought it would be a little better to get out, which I did. And did you join the, the Air National Guard, I guess? No, I, I stayed in. Reserve. I just stayed in, but I wasn't doing anything. I, take, I took some correspondence courses some. And then I was working in Venezuela. I was about to, oh, I was about to be called up. Mm -hmm. In Venezuela, I got a notice that I had to have everything in two weeks, within two weeks' notice, or expect to call up. That's what's doing the Korea more. Mm -hmm. well, finally, I got another letter from them and said, due to the nature of my employment, <laughs> I was move, moving back on this speed list, so I went back to about six weeks or something on it, and they didn't call me. And uh, the reason for not running off and trying to join in is if they called me, I had a sense job coming back. But if I left voluntarily, then I'd have to come back and just depend on whether I got a child or not. Right. Them. Well, now onto the important question. When did you start playing the saxophone again? When, when, it, when were you reunited? I'll tell you, I, I played the saxophone and the steel guitar on a national network before I, before I flew any of the military planes <laughs> at, down at the, a basic training, and uh, by the time I went in, I had already had all kind of ROTC, and I had a lot more military training than I needed. I knew the, all the marching stuff, and I knew the the code, mm -hmm. the, you know, all that. So I didn't really need to do that kind of training. And when they found out I was a musician and I could play, well, they'd a lot of practice in the day room <laughs> and make music. Right. Then we had a, we ended up with a big band and a, a network broadcast. So I played on this band, played saxophone on the band, but I was featured with a steel guitar, playing a steel guitar rag. <laughs> What 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 show was that? Do you, you remember? It, it was I don't know. It was just a I, I don't know. I think I still have some stuff on it, but it's a network of the I don't know how they put it on, but mm -hmm. it, it involved a lot of military people, and some of them were pretty famous. One of them was, was it Tony Martin, married to Sid Cherise. Was that? <laughs> he was on it, and I, one of my upperclassmen that I didn't like at first. And so we found out we were musicians, and he didn't like me. He didn't like anybody. He was a mean one at first, but once we were playing together on the music, well, he, we got along just fine. But we had a fine big band, you know. You gave up the ukulele, I guess. I didn't have the. I wasn't. I didn't have that. Then. Not not yet, but eventually. Uh, yeah, I, you don't play I still, the ukulele I still have it. <laughs> you still play it? I don't really play it, but I have it. This, this ukulele is. I don't know how much it's worth, but it's worth. <laughs> Over five hundred dollars. It's probably worth a lot more to you, though. Yeah, <laughs> you brought it all the way through the war. It's been to Venezuela and every place with me. Well, let's let's look at your uniform. Why don't you show me okay. your uniform here? You bring it over here. Oh, and then uh, after working in Venezuela, I was expecting to go back, but they had a revolution there. Kind of got got in the way, didn't it? it sort of got in the way. So one of my friends, an enthusiast, tried to get me to go down and join this civilian aviation company that talked to the Air Force when their 
primary jet training and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I went out there and I hadn't flown in 15 years, but I talked my way into it. And, and there you went, huh? What, I, what did you fly? That it was down there was the the T thirty seven jet, the little yeah. twin jet. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, show show me some of the ribbons here. Let's, I don't read it. I, I don't even remember them all. Obviously, you have you was made the rank of major, I guess. A major and a yeah. command pilot. Mm -hmm. and I know this is a Silver Star, and this is a, fly, a DFC Distinguished Flying Cross, and this is the Air Medal with about fifteen clusters or something mm -hmm. like that. This is that Presidential Unit Citation. I don't. Yeah, some of these I don't remember. Well, not some of them the campaign ribbon. I, this must be, this could be campaign ribbon because it's got some stars on it. I don't even remember what they are. Mm. But nonetheless, you've got them. I got them, yeah. <laughs> well, Mr. Smith, I, I want you to have the final word here uh, when we, as we close the interview. And, and I'd like to ask everybody this, but, but what, do you, what do you want folks to take away from, from what you guys and gals did back then? Well, I, I think that we have to realize that it's worth it. If it's worth the trouble we spend on it, and I think a lot of people, I think our military right now is they're they're great, but a lot of other people have a different attitude about it. We don't have the dedication we had when that war began. To, we don't have the dedication to want to finish the project. In my opinion. Oh, and I had a little fun afterwards, too, I, after checking out the C-119 and the C-130 and the C-124. <laughs> I owned three airplanes myself, part ownership in three airplanes. And what, what were those? I had two Cessna 210s and a mm -hmm. 206, and they were all dual instrument with them. Mm -hmm. And even made money one year, releasing it to the FAA. <laughs> <laughs> you found a way to make the money. Yeah, you made a little bit. Well, I can't thank you enough for your service and for, for letting us uh, come in today and, and talk to you. I really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for being patient with me. Well, no, thank you. I, I, wish, I, I wish I could see that ukulele, though. I'll show you the ukulele. <laughs> I'll have well, to It's you. been through a lot, and yeah. it it's pretty well stays in tune. And This hot rock pilot that I said was my pilot when I first got in that... His idea was that you should be able to follow him. He played ukulele very, very well. And he was also a chess champion. Watch your head. This is the original ukulele and the original case. And what year do you think you bought the ukulele? In 44. Wow. When was the last time you played it? Well, I don't play it really now. But. Pretty, it's pretty close to being in tune now. <laughs> it's close. That's, it, it's, it's held tuned for... <laughs> there are two tunings and I've, I've gotten my priorities mixed up and which one I want to, <laughs> want to use. This is a <coughs> simple one. I know this, this, this is a C, right? And this is a D seventh. So there you have it, a fighter pilot and ukulele player. It just goes to show you, you can't judge a book by its cover or a fighter pilot by the musical instrument they play. Thanks for listening and please tell your friends about us. And be sure and stay tuned, because there's more great Warbird Radio programming coming up right after this. This is Warbird Radio.